Okay, so we have been talking around a very good question. If we offer a course on biodiversity inventories, why should we do biodiversity inventories? Let's Let's compare these two versions of Cameroon, okay? In kind of a random record world, we have records just coming from here and there across the country. And in an inventory world, we focus our effort at spots, okay? And I can't tell you that one is necessarily better. I can tell you that more information is better, right? If we had 100,000 dots on this map instead of 25, it would be better. But I want you to think a bit about the value added, essentially the extra lessons that we get by going to one place and working at it intensively. And as you'll see tomorrow, part of that word intensively means inventorying its fauna or flora completely, or you know, at least with the goal of completeness. So I just want you to think about this pair of maps on the side of detailed site inventories. We get good information on local communities, we get information on associations among species, either co-occurrence or repulsion. Eventually they don't co-occur. We get comprehensive information about sites. And I think you could argue that it leverages a maximum of information content from the same amount of data. On the other side, you get more sites. You get a little bit or a non-zero amount of information about more places across the landscape. But you lose these advantages of having a lot of information and even better, complete information from a site. And that's a big loss. So let's think about inventories. A detailed, concentrated characterization of species present at a defined site at a defined time. I'm giving lots of definitions in this course. I don't like that. Anyhow, that's a definition. But it's coordinated and connected information that ties presence of particular species to presence or absence of other species. And that can be very useful. Um, you can plan your inventories to maximize the utility across a region. For example, as Moses talked about within Rumpy Hills, you can also stratify your inventory efforts across biomes or ecosystems, across a country or across a region. The other thing is very practical. There is a, an advantage in terms of efficiency. You get to one place and you don't have to move, you don't have to drive, you don't have to set up your tent at a new place. You're there. And as you see, as of Sunday evening, I promise you, I will be sitting in the bird tent skinning birds as fast as I can. And I'm not going to move. I'm not going to roll up my sleeping bag in that week. Okay? It'll be full time. I wish I would be out netting and trapping and observing and recording and skinning. So there's certainly a saving of time because you're not dealing with 10 different landowners, you're not changing camp, you're not seeking water. Whatever the logistical challenge is, you do it once and not 10 times or 20 times. So in contrast, when you essentially just assemble data at random, you can call this found data, right? I happened on a particular snake going across the road or uh, I stopped along the road and collected this bird. Um, you get less information overall. Your characterization of particular sites will be incomplete. 
And you need to remember that sometimes you're working at sites that are so poorly known that your inventory translates into a protected area. And simply the, the fact that you've published that inventory can attract attention from conservation organizations. In the best of situations, you're working in some degree of coordination with whoever's doing the conservation in your country or your region. But that argument becomes much more powerful if there's a published inventory. You lose all of the power of organized sampling, which is to say you don't know when um, your inventory is complete. You don't know when you maybe should be trusting that a particular species is absent. But you do get some information about more places. And so there is a place for found data. You know, there is a place for driving around the country or around the region and just getting preliminary information. And then probably you want to go back and do the inventories. So in the course in Uganda, um, Moses was developing a project on essentially the status of knowledge of the Cameroon Highland floras. And so we assembled a, um, a digital elevation model and we identified all of the areas above 1600 meters across the region. So this is what you're seeing there. Here's Mount Cameroon, we're right here. And then you can see 1600 meter sites that that are relatively connected. And then you can see these tiny little islands, some off into Nigeria as well, and some very, very distant. And so what Moses has done is then to rank those sites as completely unknown, as some information existing, but kind of random, disorganized, nothing that you could in any sense term complete versus a relatively complete inventory, okay? And so what we did in those, the, that past course, which was on national biodiversity diagnoses or diagnostics, is for each of actually eight data sets, Moses's was one, we identified the gaps in sampling spatially and environmentally. So here, go back and you can see, for example, this well-known site. There's that same well-known site and so you can see it is very low, very light in geographic distance to a well-known site. But these sites, and especially these sites, are geographically very far from a well-known site. These are the well-known sites, okay? And then there's a complementary view, which is environmental difference. So here, what we're asking is not a question of how far spatially, how many kilometers away, but we're saying if you take the climate or the, the vegetation dynamics of, let's say, this site, how different are those environmental characteristics from the nearest well-known site. It doesn't need to be the nearest spatially. It could be a site here that environmentally is very similar. And there's some interesting things that come out of this. Notice these sites, which are very far away, very, very uh, remote from the main chain of the Cameroon Mountains. And you can see that in the geographic distance map but environmentally, notice that they're not that different from a well-known site, okay? So that, that's kind of a, a, a strategy for if you wanted then to go in and do new inventories, probably what you would do is go to the most distant sites spatially and the most distant sites environmentally and you'd probably prioritize a site that is distant both spatially and environmentally because those are the ones that are both different in conditions and far from anything that's well known. 
So then I figured I'd, I'd play a little bit with, remember, digital accessible knowledge, which we talked about the first day. And so I just went into GBIF and looked at what data are digital and shared. And you get 150,000 records across all of life. Okay? You can also see some garbage. So this is in the, in the field that is called class. And so we get, you know, class amphibia and class aves. And then we get heterochromous multidens, which I don't know what class it belongs to. Fish sounds right. Um, and so what you see right away is that somebody needs to do some data cleaning, but that's the subject of a different course, okay? Um, and then you also see that, well, the two biggest classes as far as numbers are amphibia and birds. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Sorry, the third biggest class is birds, Tom. Yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> In my own defense, I pit. <laughs> Why didn't you combine these? You should have thought about this, Brendan. Okay, can somebody escort the herpetologist outside, please? Um, in my own defense, I picked the class that had the largest numbers, okay? But all I'm after is that you can see right away some of the usual digital data nightmares, the need for data cleaning. But let's go into this number. 65,498. So if I plot them out on the map, they look like that. Anybody know what that point is? I told you about this earlier. Zero, zero. Thank you. You're learning a lot. Oh, we trust it. <laughs> so a lot, of, a lot of data wardens, shall we say, instead of putting blank, blank, put zero, zero. And they forget that zero, zero is a place. It's not a very likely place for a, an amphibian from Cameroon, but it is a place. And then this, that's an error, right? But notice, out of 65,498 original records, 3,180, so 5% have been georeferenced. You remember my talk about data leaks? You guys want to produce a ton of data quickly. You've got one major leak, which is georeferencing. And it's one of the easiest leaks. You guys know camera, right? There are protocols for georeferencing. So if you just step in and take those 62,318 records that don't have geographic references, you could probably at least increase the digital accessible knowledge of amphibians of Cameroon at least by tenfold. And you could do it in a few months. Okay? Anyhow, that's not the point. That's, that's, those are the subjects of other courses that we've done. But this was the really interesting thing. The only three sites within those 3,180 points, the only three sites where there were more than 100 records of any sort for amphibia are those three sites. So really this Cameroon for amphibia based on digital accessible knowledge, Cameroon for amphibia falls into that random records category, even though a bunch of people, Dave included, over the years have done intensive site inventories. But that's the depressing state of digital accessible knowledge. That's another reason to go in and produce those detailed site inventories. So I figured, okay, forget about precise latitude-longitude coordinates. In Darwin Core, which is the data architecture for GBIF. Did I do something wrong? No, no, I just, no, go ahead. Okay. I'm surprised by what you wrote there. It's probably true. 
Well, the, the, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, in the georeference in Darwin Core is a field specific locality. And so I downloaded everything from GBIF and I tallied up the number of records, which is this, for each specific locality. I just plotted those out. Sorry, no, no, no. Number of records is here, and this is the frequency. So here we have probably one locality that has 35 records from it. Okay? Now, notice that maybe this locality and this locality have the same latitude, longitude coordinates. All I did was use unique text strings. Rafe, this is how we use pivot tables. Okay? So, 59,000 of those records did not have uh, specific localities. Remember, sometimes they're not shared, and sometimes they get stripped off by some mistake or some, um, some inconsistency. And once again, you see, I mean, Dave, how many herps does it take to make a full site inventory in Cameroon? 500? So, yeah, a couple hundred, I mean, yeah. Yeah, nobody is up there. No sites, very few sites. But, yeah. In terms of digital accessible knowledge. So go back to that data leaks diagram. It's in terms of texture, right? Yeah. So the way that herbs and birds people take. No, the birds aren't in here. This is just amphibia. I know, but so we have probably more detailed texture okay. that are for a given site that is heterogeneity in one okay. place, right? Anyhow, I can do this for any one of your countries and I'll get the same answer. I did it for birds in Kenya. <coughs> Started with 100, 110,000 records and I ended up with 15,000 that were usable. Okay? That's, again, subject of different courses. Cameroon, at least what is digital and accessible is a non-systematic disorganized array of casual collecting sites. Okay, and that information can be hugely useful. And you can see our previous courses, we're gonna make all the links available to you guys, um, but our previous courses on ecological niche modeling, on national biodiversity diagnoses, those data can be great but you do lose that value added, which is from having concentrated information from sites. So this is essentially, in terms of science, in terms of things you can learn, why do the inventory? And I just want to give you a really quick overview. I think we've already made most of these points. I want to give you a little bit more illustration and. I'll give you a, a few illustrations and then Rafe and Dave will each give you an illustration and then we'll go on to uh, working with GPS units, okay? So just let's go into this a bit. Basic communi community composition. That's one of the most immediate things you get out. You saw those um, publications of the inventory, for example, that Rafe showed you, where it was basically a list of, of species and maybe some ancillary information about their abundance. Um, 